going to start with some introductory material just to make sure we know what the problem is that we're actually studying. Um, talk a little bit, of, build up some of the definitions and the terminology we need to actually discuss this. Uh, you go from there. So what is this problem that we're studying? I'm going to start with the Munge problem. So here we're taking this back to the 18th century in France and uh, the French mathematician Gaspard Monge said, oh, let's suppose I have some pile of sand over here and I would like to transport it into some hole over there. Uh, so in other words, what I want to know is I want to come up with a good trans transport plan. So given uh, some mass at a point x, and we have to do this all throughout this pile of sand, where do I want to transport the mass from that point to? And we'll call that point T of x. Uh, and if things can be more complicated, you know, you may not have a uniform distribution of sand. Maybe it comes with some density, f, and uh, maybe you have some desired target density, g. And we want to, OK, there's lots of different ways of rearranging this pile into that. Um, we want to do this in a cost-efficient way. So the problem here is to try to minimize. Okay, so for each unit of mass, we're going to look at, say, um, what Monge originally said was the distance that we transport a unit of mass. Um, and then it has to be weighted by how much we're actually moving. So that's this density f. Right? So we want to find the map that rearranges this density into this density and minimizes some cost function. I actually, I grew up on a farm where we had to, we weren't moving piles of sand, usually we were moving heaps of manure. Uh, so my parents have suggested that I try to get a grant to study this and maybe funds to buy a new tractor to move the manure around. Uh, uh, but there's, again, a lot of different things you can look at. So sand, maybe you don't care about moving around. Uh, another problem would be like a mines to factories problem. So here the game may be that you have several mines that are producing resources. And now you, know, you get the resources out of the mines, but now you want to do something with them. You need to transport them to your collection of factories. So now the question becomes, OK, the resources from this mine, which factory should I send them to, or factories? Similarly with the others, right? And you want to obviously do it in a way that is going to minimize some kind of cost of transporting the resources because this is not free. Okay, I'll, I'll also mention that Homage looked at this cost um, being the distance a unit of mass is traveled, transported. You don't have to do that. You can look at other costs, and in most applications, you actually do look at other costs. So we can also consider other costs. Okay, so you have some cost function that says, how much does it cost to move a unit of mass from x to y? And then you're trying to minimize the transport cost. Okay, same deal. But now it's the difference between x and where it maps to, weighted by our density. Yes? What is the space we're integrating over? Uh, good question. Uh, it depends. Right now, I'm imagining we're in Rn. Okay. So we have some uh, density or measure in Rn. Uh, you can imagine things over uh, more, more interesting spaces. Um, but, but typically, these will be subsets of Rn. Um, so we've got you know, sand. We've got mines to factories. Um, you can have densities that come from the pixel intensity on an image, for example. Uh, so if you imagine an MRI, for example, uh, there's a really natural interpretation in terms of densities. An MRI tells you proton density. Uh, so one application of this is, uh, let's say, you have an MRI of somebody's brain. And maybe you've pinpointed a trouble region. Now, later on, you take a, another image at a different time, 
it's from a different machine, from a slightly different angle. The person's lying at a slightly different angle. And the brain isn't rigid. The brain is like jelly. Um, and you want to say, you know, how do parts of this image correspond to parts of this image? Or a more complicated problem, now we've put this person on the operating table and cracked her skull open, and the surgeon wants to know, you know, where do I have to, where do I have to cut, where do I have to dig based on information from this MRI? Um, and there's models for this using optimal transportation. Um, you can have densities that come from intensity of, of a light source, and then there's problems where you want to design a system of, of lenses or a system of mirrors where you take one light source and transform it into something else. Um, well, when I had my, my undergrad students working with me a couple of years ago, their favorite example was the headlight example. That they just hate it. Don't you hate it when somebody is flashing their high beams at you? Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we could have a, some kind of reflector that says we don't really want a symmetric high beam. We want something that lets us see in front of us, but maybe it doesn't try to shine too much in the oncoming traffic's face. Um, and there's the model for this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lighting companies that are very interested in these uh, techniques. Um, designing a reflector antenna for astronomers uses these kind of techniques. It can mo be modeled as an optimal transportation problem. Um, you can think of densities coming from the distribution of matter in the universe. Uh, and there's models for trying to say, how does, how does this evolve over time? Or especially, how did this evolve backwards? You know, where did this all come from? And trying to look at the early structure of the universe using models that involve opt optimal transportation. Um, we can look at the, the cost of transporting things and int interpret it as some kind of distance uh, and compare, say, observed data with simulated data and try to tune some parameters in a way that minimizes this cost. Um, and this is something that we've done rec fairly recently in seismology. Um, and you'd have similar kinds of problems coming up in machine learning. Uh, mesh generation, the Met Office in the UK is interested in optimal transport techniques for generating their meshes uh, on the sphere because they use, they use code that assumes you have a basically a really nice structured mesh. They don't want to rewrite all their code from scratch. Um, so they need a way to come up with a simple map from a very uniform mesh that they want to compute on to something that actually is re reasonable for the problems that they're studying that will concentrate mesh points in the regions where things are happening. Um, it may follow hills and valleys, things like that. Uh, again, these are modeled using optimal transportation. And there's, there's lots of other applications. Okay, so this is the problem. This is a little bit why we care about it, but let's try to set it up a little bit. All right, so we're not, in general, going to work with densities like this. We're going to, some of the time we will, oh, but in general, we can set this problem up using measures. Okay, so we want to work with measures. Okay, in general. Uh, so we're going to have a source measure. That I'll call mu, and a target measure that I'll call nu. Okay, and then as you probably expect, uh, the measure mu of e just tells us how much mass is present in the set e. So this tells us how much mass we have in the set E. OK, this is more general than working with densities. For example, we could have point masses, right? Or the density is effectively a, a direct delta function, which is, which is not a function, of course. All right, so measures let us interpret these kind of things. Um, we're going to require mass balance, right? So when I'm transporting my sand or whatever I'm transporting, I'm, I'm just moving it. I'm not creating it or I'm not destroying it. I'm just moving it. Uh, so that means that 
uh, the total amount of mass in the source has to equal the total amount in the target. So we need mass balance. Okay, so this means that mu, uh, let's say Rn for now, is equal to nu of Rn. Okay, um, in a lot of problems, we're going to assume that this total amount of mass is equal to one. Um, often these are interpreted as probability measures. But it's not, it's not critical that it be one. Okay, so we have uh, our measures that we want to map between, and now we seek a transport map. Okay, uh, so I'm going to call this T of X. Okay, and this should move mass from the source to the target. Um, so say my source is supported on a set X, and my target is supported on a set Y, uh, then we're looking at maps from X onto Y. And uh, we assume X and Y are subsets of Rn. Um, we want to conserve mass, right? So I said, I said in words somewhere, there we go, we need mass balance, right? But more than that, we want to rearrange this density or this measure into this one, right? Somehow, somehow when we've done this map, this should be transformed into the right density or distribution of mass, okay? So we want to conserve mass, not just globally, but, but locally. Okay, so what does that look like? Let's draw a picture here. So let's say this is my starting distribution. Uh, now we map this, we map everything through this map T that we're trying to come up with, and we should get something. And somehow, uh, what this map should produce um, should be our desired target new. Okay, so let's try to think about what this map produces. We want to somehow define the, the measure that this map produced. So if we're going to try to define the measure, we need to say, how does it act on, on different sets? So let's just take a generic set over here in our target. And we can say, we can try to imagine uh, asking ourselves, where did this mass come from, right? This map T took stuff over here into here. Now we want to go back and say, where did this came, come from? Well, this came from wherever, right? We can look at all the points that ended up mapping into the set A. Uh, and that we can denote by T inverse of A. Right, so T applied to T inverse of A gives us the set A that I started with over here. Okay, now what do I require? I require that we've conserved mass, right? And that means that the total amount of mass in this little set here had better equal the total amount of mass in this little set over here, no matter what little sets I picked. Okay, so what we're going to require is that mu of T inverse of A is equal to nu of A, right? And this should be true for any set that we look at, for any measurable set. Okay, so this needs to be true for all A uh, that, that live in Y. Okay, you believe this? Uh, so right now, right now, yes. So what I mean by T inverse A is all the points um, 
that got mapped to here. But yes, there is, there is a little bit of regularity uh, underlying this. And, and, and it's actually a good point to make that we're going to, to learn in a little bit that there are some issues with this formulation. And, and we may need different formulations sometimes. OK, so, so this, this defines a new measure. This defines somehow what the map T does to the, our original source measure, yes? All right, so we're going to call this uh, the push forward of the measure mu through the map T. So this measure here is called the push forward of mu through T. Okay, and we have a symbol for that. We write that as, okay, T push forward of mu. Okay, so now when we come back to mass balance and say that we're trying to take this distribution and rearrange it into that, now our statement is that the push forward of mu through the map T has to equal mu, right? So we take this measure, we map it, we get our desired target measure. So this is the statement of mass uh, conservation or measure conservation. That the push forward of mu is equal to mu. Okay, so this is the Monge formulation of the optimal transportation problem. So the Monge formulation is of optimal transportation is, okay, so we want to find a measure T uh, to minimize this cost. So we want to minimize, okay, uh, for now I'll write this as Rn. We could also write it as capital X. So the cost of moving from x to t of x. And now again, we're weighting it by how much mass we're moving. So we're weighting it by this source measure. And we don't just want uh, any, old, any old map. We want something that indeed produces the correct target measure. So we want the push forward uh, of mu through t to be equal to nu. Okay, so this is one of the major formulations of the key problem that we're studying this semester. And this is Moja's formulation. All right, are we happy with that? Uh, what are some problems with this? Oh, one, one potential problem has come up of, you know, do, do we have enough regularity to make sense of this? Um, what are some other issues that you might worry about with this formulation? Global minimizer to that? Is there a minimizer? Okay, that's all, you know. That should, be, that should be an obvious question any time I, I take them in of something is, does that thing even exist? Okay, so is there a minimizer? Okay, good, what else? Is it unique? Is it unique? Good. Right, uh, those are always, anytime you are given any kind of math problem, those are the good questions to ask, right? Does the solution exist? Is it the only one? Anyone else? Stability. Stability, stability is always a good question to ask, sure.
these, again, these are, you've just written down well posed and it's for me. Is that, you've asked me if this problem is well posed and that's always a good question to ask. Uh, anything else? What's the space that you're minimizing over? Uh, so the space that I'm minimizing over is going to be measures that satisfy this constraint. Uh, sorry, mappings that minimize that satisfy this constraint. Um, but okay, so where are you? What's that? It's not empty. It's not empty. Good. Is there? Is this problem actually feasible? Right? Can I actually come up with any one mapping to you that that accomplishes this? You know, forget trying to minimize this thing. Can I actually find out any mapping that actually rearranges this into this? Is it feasible? Okay, those are okay. Those are the key theoretical questions that I wrote down. Um, uh, another. Okay, I'm an applied mathematician. Also, uh, obviously, another interesting question is if we're going to use this for applications, how do we actually come up with the solution computationally? So if, if we are so lucky that there's a solution, how do we compute it? Those were my, that was my list, but if anybody else wants to throw out any other issues before we move on, I'll give you a chance. I'm going to write down a couple of little examples um, just to indicate that actually these are important questions to ask because the answers, you know, they, they don't come for free. Uh, so one that I'll start with is the book moving problem. Okay, so I have, I have my shelf full of books. It's a small shelf today. I only have two, All right? And they're sitting over here. I'd like them to be shifted over, though, occupying this space here. Okay. Now, the question is, how should I do that? Should I do this and this, or I could just pick up this book and do that? And that those would both be measure-preserving uh, mappings. Well, what's my constraint? So now we have to, we need more information before we can decide which one is better, which one is optimal. Okay, so I have these two books, and I want to somehow transport them over to here and here. All right, so let's think about a couple different cost functions. Um, let's start with start with Homage's cost function. All right, so what's optimal uh, if I use this cost function? You think moving all the other book over? Okay, so if we, who said that? You did. They're the same, that's right. So there's two, p two plans here, two plans I would uh, preserve our measure, preserve mass. Here there are two uh, mass preserving plans. One of them says I'm going to take this one book and move it over two units. So that's a cost of two. The other one says I'm going to take this book and move it one unit. I'm going to take this book and also move it one unit. That's a total cost of two as well. So both have cost of two. So here we have non-uniqueness, right, with a very simple problem. Okay, now this doesn't have to be the case. Um, it turns out in this for this problem, the issue was this cost function that I chose. If I do it again with a quadratic cost, Now, which solution is optimal? Move one book 
Move one, move one book over at both of them? Uh, or move one book all the way over? All the way over. Okay, you think one, moving one book all the way over. So what happens then? We've taken this one, one book and moved it over two units. And we have to square it. So that becomes a cost of four over two. And what's the cost of the other plan? The other plan is to slide them both. So this moves one, it's a cost of one squared. This moves one, that's a cost of one squared. Total cost of two divided by two is one. So in this case, for the quadratic cost, there is a unique solution that we want to take our books and slide them over uh, smoothly. Okay, so now we do have a unique solution. Okay, so it turns out actually that quadratic cost is much easier to deal with in, in general. And actually a lot of our time this semester, not all of it, but a lot of our time will be focused on the quadratic cost. This is the case where most past work has been done, where we know, we know most about what happens here. Um, this case uh, doesn't fit any of the usual regularity assumptions that you, that you would want. Uh, and non-uniqueness is certainly an issue here. You can still do things with this case, and, and people do sometimes, um, but there's issues. Okay, even for quadratic cost, we could have non-uniqueness. So let's say, let's say this is my source, and let's say these are my targets. Uh, now there's different ways that you could rearrange these things, right? I could take this dot here and this dot here. Or I could do it the other way. I could take this dot here and this dot here, right? There's no difference in the cost, even if I use the nice quadratic cost. Um, so this is another example where we have non-uniqueness. Okay, and th this can be an issue with point masses. Um, so, okay, uniqueness. Uniqueness is, is not obvious. Um, feasibility is another uh, big one. Uh, so, let's come up with a really simple example. Uh, okay, say I have one mass here. So, let's see, a mass um, is equal to one at this point, and this is my source. And now my target is over here. But my t target consists of two smaller Dirac masses. Okay, so this is mass is a equal to a half, and this one also mass is equal to one half. Now I have some cost that I want to minimize, but it's over the feasible set that's mappings that go from here to here, right? And now how do I do that? I can't do that, right? I can take this to here but then I've, I've missed all this mass, or I can take it to here, and I've missed all of this mass. In this case, if you want to try to rearrange from here to here, you've got to allow mass to split. And, and this is a natural problem if we go back to the mines and factories problems, right? There's, why, why should we require that the number of mines is equal to the number of factories, right? That's silly. Um, we need to be able to say, okay, I have resources coming from this mine, and it's going to get shipped out to a bunch of different factories, right? But using the formulation we've got here where T is a mapping, I, ca I cannot do that, right? T, does, T as a mapping does not allow mass to split like that. So this is a downside to the Mosh formulation. It's, it's, a, it's a gray formulation to work with uh, for many problems. It's easier to work with for a lot of problems, but, but you need to make sure you're in the regime where it makes sense, okay? So in this case, uh, there's no feasible mapping. Okay? We need to uh, be able to allow mass to split. Happy with that? Okay, so we need a new formulation. 
So we're going to try to generalize this uh, optimal transport problem via the Kantorovich formulation. Okay, so it's still we w we're still somehow solving the same problem. Um, we hope that the formulation we come up with here is going to be equivalent to the Mosh formulation when both of them actually make sense. But we want to have a little more generality here. We want to be allowed to, to split mass. So now we are seeking not a transport map, but a transport plan. And the transport plan is going to allow mass to go lots of different places. Okay, uh, so this is again not a map, it allows mass to be split. So mass from X can go to multiple points, it could go to a continuum of points even. Uh, that should all be allowed. All right, so we definitely want to be working with measures here, not densities, when we set this up. So we're going to start with our source measure and target measure. Okay, so we're going to have a source measure, mu, okay, this is nothing new, supported on a set x, and a target measure, mu, supported on a set y. So what we need to do, given any point x or any little set, I need to decide how much mass moves from x to any given point y. And it could be, you know, and we've got to check this for lots of different points y. So we want to know how much mass gets moved from x to y for any combination of points in x and y. Okay, so somehow my transport plan now is going to be a function of multiple variables, right? It's going to be a function of my, my domain, my source, uh, right, which lives on this set x, but it also has to be able to take a second variable from this set y, right? Uh, and then it's going to say how much mass moved from this variable to this variable. Okay, so we are going to store this in another measure that I'll call pi. Okay, and again, pi has to be defined on the product space. It needs to be able to take these two variables. is defined on x cross y. Right, so in a simple example, let's say I have a mine at x equals zero with one unit of a resource. And let's say I have factories at y equals 0 and 1 with, say, one-thirds and two-thirds units, or receiving one-third and two-thirds units, respectively. Okay, in this case, it's clear what the, what the plan has to be, right? Uh, of all the resources that I have here, uh, one-third of it is going to y equals zero, and two-thirds of it is going to y equals one. That's the plan. So I have this, for example, pi of zero, zero. How much mass is going from zero to zero? Well, that's one-third. How much mass is going from zero to one? Well, that's going to be two-thirds. Uh, 
if I look at, say, how much mass is going from 0 to all of R, that's all of it. Right, and, and so on, right? You can define what this has to be everywhere. Okay, and in general. Okay, so if A is a set that's contained in my source and B is a set that's contained in my target, then pi of AB tells us how much mass moves from A to B. Makes sense. This is a reasonable way of trying to of trying to represent our transportation plan. Okay. Uh, and now we need to try to formulate an optimal transportation problem that will let us hopefully solve for this beast. Okay. We still want mass conservation, right? So I still want to make sure that my source mass my source measure gets rearranged into my target measure. Okay, so we need to conserve mass. Okay, so let's try to figure out what kind of constraint that now gives us on this set pi. Okay, so let's choose some um, point x and let's consider pi at x and capital Y. So what's the interpretation of that? Yeah, so that's all the mass from point x, right? This, this consists of all our p potential target points, so it's how much mass went to y1 and how much mass went from x to y2 and all the other points, right? And that's all the places it could have been. So at the end of the day, this better add up to the total amount of mass we started with at the point x, yes? So this better be equal to mu of x. Okay, so this is the total mass coming from x. It has to go somewhere. Right, and, and we can do the same thing if we switch the variables. We better get our measure new. Okay, and more generally, I could do this not just for a point x, I could do this for a set. So more generally, if a is any set, living in x, we want pi, the set a, and the set y, right? Now, this is looking at all the possible mass coming from anywhere in a, right? These are all, the, these is the total of all the places that it could go to, there's no other options. So this better give us the total amount of mass we started with in a. Okay, and this has to be true for any set. So here we're going to say that mu is the marginal of pi on x. So pi, right, consists of these two variables. Uh, if we if we restrict it, so we we basically integrate out all of the y dependence, and we're left with a measure that just depends on where we are in our x domain. So we're going to say that mu is the marginal. of pi on x, right? Again, we've integrated away all the y dependence, um, and we're just left with something that cares where we were in the a set. OK, and of course, we can do the same thing uh, if we look at the other variable. OK, 
Okay? So also, we need mu to be the marginal of pi on y. All right? In other words, if b is a set in y, then, all right, now we integrate away all the x dependents. Pi of xb should give us our target measure. OK, this is our new constraint. Instead of having a condition on t and looking at the push forward of the measure under t, and now we have this constraint on the marginals of pi. The marginals of pi are mu and nu, respectively. So these two statements, so you're just saying that the densities match up? They're just saying that the densities match up, exactly. All right, but already um, you can hopefully see that whereas with when I was looking at the push forward through a mapping, oh, we saw that uh, this was not necessarily a feasible. Here, this is going to be feasible, right? As long as we have the same total mass here and the same total mass here, we should be able to find some way anyway, maybe not a good way, but some way of rearranging uh, where we haven't lost any mass or gained any mass. Okay, then we need to measure the cost. So we know how to measure the constraint. How do we measure the cost? Well, now, given any point x and any point y, right, in our source and our targets, we can look at the cost of transporting uh, between them. And now we have to weight this by how much mass is actually getting transported uh, between these two points. So this needs to be weighted by the amount of mass that actually does go between x and y. Okay, and this is the Kantorovich formulation. Okay, so we're still doing optimal transport. We've just reformulated the problem a little bit to be a little bit more general. And we're trying to find the infimum, or hopefully, if we're lucky, the minimum. But of course, we know those aren't the same thing necessarily. And, and we'll get more into whether we can actually minimize this thing. So now we're looking at the cost of going from x to y. Again, that has to be weighted. So it's going to be weighted by how much actually moves from x to y. We're integrating this over all possible mass. So this is over the set x cross y. Okay, where I'm going to give you some shorthand notation for the constraint and write out what that means. Uh, but to keep from saying in long, long words every time this statement about the marginals, uh, we're going to say that we're looking over measures pi that belong to the set capital pi of mu nu. Okay, where capital pi consists of measures that have the correct marginals. Okay, so whose marginals on x and y are going to be our desired source and target. Questions?
OK, so this is a nice formulation. I mean, we saw that it's a little more general than the Walsh formulation, because we can split mass. Um, it turns out this will lead to, it's very valuable theoretically. Even when, you're in, even when you're living in the regime where the Mosh formulation makes sense, this can be easier to work with and to learn things about. Um, it admits a really nice dual formulation that we're going to use to learn a lot that, uh, that we can then take back to the Mosh problem. Um, one thing uh, that's kind of interesting to see uh, so our unknown, our unknown is this measure pi here, right? Uh, this objective function actually is linear in pi. So that's kind of nice. That, that turns out to be useful. Uh, whereas our original Mosh formulation where we're saying, okay, now let's look at the push forward uh, of this measure through a map, it was very nonlinear constraint. So when you can make things linear, life usually gets easier. So this be gets, becomes very theoretically valuable. Um, it's the basis of some numerical methods, not necessarily the, the best ones that are out there, um, uh, but there is some use there. There are some special cases. So we can certainly work with very general crazy measures if we want to, um, but there's three special cases that are the most common ones. One would be Okay, one would be discrete optimal transport. Okay, this is where we've got a collection of Dirac masses, point masses, and we're mapping to another collection of point masses. Okay, so we have Dirac masses to Dirac masses. Okay, and if this is the problem that you're interested in, then there are tools available uh, for trying to do that. You know, Minds to Factories would be an example of this. Uh, there is continuous optimal transport. Okay, uh, this would be where mu and nu are, are nice measures, absolutely continuous. Uh, with densities. Okay, lots of applications get, get modeled this way where you have some sort of density that you're morphing onto another density somehow, oh, in imaging or mesh generation or whatever. Uh, so this is very natural to study. Uh, and then the other case would be semi-discrete. Okay, this would be uh, where you have, say, mu is absolutely continuous and nu consists of Dirac's. The cosmology problem where you're looking at the structure of the early universe fits in this framework where they typically think of the early universe being sort of a smooth blob, whatever. Whereas now you look out and we've got highly concentrated mass, widely separated, right? Uh, so the first approximation that looks like a bunch of Dirac's. Oh. Also, what sometimes is done is to say you have two continuous measures and let's approximate one of them by a whole lot of Dirac masses and you can use tools from here to study that as well. Uh, but depending on your problem, there's different tools available to, to deal with them. Okay, so I'm gonna start. We wanna try to build up, build up some understanding uh, of this problem. Um, does this problem make sense? Do we have a minimum? What can we learn about the transport plan? Are there any special properties? How are we going to compute this thing at the end of the day? Um, but I'm going to start simple. I'm going to start with one dimension. Let's see what, what tricks we can learn in one dimension, uh, some of which kind of translates or gives us some intuition in higher dimensions, some of which turns it doesn't. One dimension is fundamentally 
easier than higher dimensions. But let's start here. Okay, um, I'm going to, for the sake of argument through here, I'm, I'm not going to uh, try to pin down every technical rigorous detail. I'm going to assume everything is nice enough for me to do what I need to do. Okay, so let's assume things are nice enough, whatever that means. I'm mostly just trying to get some intuition here. Okay, so what's our goal? Uh, let's find t of x to minimize. I'll do a quadratic cost. Okay, so we're in 1D, so we're integrating over r x minus t of x squared weighted by some density f of x. Oh. We're back to the Mosh formulation for now. Okay, and we have some constraint. Uh, a constraint here was on this push forward, right? So if we looked at t inverse a, uh, now we're integrating a density, and that should be the same as integrating our target density over A. Okay, so this is for all sets A in R, for all measurable sets in R. I'm just going to write a note here about another way of writing this constraint. Uh, we could ask that, given any function h, uh, this map t should preserve should preserve uh, preserve measure, and it's going to preserve what happens if we integrate over h. So h of y, g of y. Uh, and this should be true no matter what function h we choose. So say for all continuous functions on x. All right, now I want to try to think about if we can learn some properties of the optimal map, uh, if, if one exists, in this setting. Again, I'm going to, only in the interest of time and, and not getting bogged down in technical details here, I'm assuming that things are nice enough to be able to do what I want to do, because we're just trying to get intuition here. Uh, you can certainly make these arguments more rigorously. Okay, so let's try to learn about the map. So as we do that, let's pick two points. Okay, x1 and x2. And I'll assume x1 is less than x2. Okay, and some epsilon. Okay, and we're going to make two little open intervals. Uh, in, around these points. I'm going to call these uh, I1 and I2. So with x1 belonging to I1 and x2 belonging to I2. And I'm going to ask that the total amount of mass in each interval is epsilon. Okay, so such that the mass in here is equal to epsilon and the mass in here is equal to epsilon. All right, here's the picture. So I have some f. I've picked an x1 and an x2. I've built a little interval around them. Okay. 
And now I want to know what my optimal transport map is doing to these things. So now we go through our map T, whatever it is. Uh, we know that we're trying to generate some target density G, whatever it is. OK, we have a map. The map is going to take x1 somewhere. I don't know where, but let's just put it here. And the map is going to take x2 somewhere. Let's put it here. Um, uh, maybe they're switched. I don't know. I'm not assuming that. And the map is going to take these intervals somewhere. OK, I don't know if they're going to continue to be little intervals, but I'm going to draw them that way. OK, so yi is equal to t of xi. It's just the point where x gets mapped to. And ji is equal to t of i sub i. Right? So it's a, it's a set where this interval got mapped onto. Now, I said, I don't really know if y1 should be here and y2 should be here, or maybe they should be switched. I'm not sure. I've drawn them one way. But let's just try to think about what would happen if we, if we swapped them. If instead of i1 going into this space, i1 moved on to this space, and i2 moved into this space. OK, so I'm going to permute part of the map. and create a new map. OK, and this is what I'm going to require of it. So what I'm going to require is what I said this point, instead of going to y1, is no going to y2. So t tilde of x1 is equal to y2. And t tilde of x2 is now equal to y1. And similarly, I'm going to somehow take all the mass that's in here, and in a measure-preserving way, I'm going to move it over into here, into this set. So t tilde of i1 is now equal to j2, and t tilde of i2 is now equal to j1. OK, so I've messed. Th this, is a, this is a small interval, right? Because I've only got epsilon amount of mass in here. Uh, so I've messed with what the map does in these little places. But everywhere else, I don't want to touch it. So everywhere else, I'm going to let it be the same. So t tilde of x equals t of x. Uh, everywhere else. Okay, so if x does not belong to i1 or i2. I don't know a whole lot about these maps, but I know, I, I assumed that the original map I started with was optimal. So if t is optimal, t tilde is not optimal, right? t tilde is going to give me a bigger cost, or the same cost. OK, so t was optimal. OK, and again, there was nothing special about my picture that said that these translated this way. They could have been swapped. Okay, so t is optimal. So what does that mean? That means if I look at the cost of uh, x minus t of x squared weighted by f. This was over r. This is going to be smaller than or possibly equal to the cost that I get with my new map. OK. 
Okay, most of the contributions to these integrals are the same on both sides of this inequality, right? Because I've only changed the map in a couple little places, so, right? So it's good enough to integrate just over these two intervals. That preserves this inequality. Um, it's also true if I multiply this out, okay, I have an integral of x squared weighted by f on this side. I have an integral of x squared weighted by f on this side. Those are the same regardless. I have an integral of t of x squared weighted by f and an integral of t tilde squared weighted by f. Those are also the same because I've assumed that I have a measure preserving map. So really all that matters is the cross terms. And all that matters is the cross terms on these two little intervals. Which, which is good because now we've, instead of having something that really talks about an integral over everywhere, we've got just about, we've just about zeroed in on these two points. We're sitting within, you know, epsilon roughly of those two points. Okay, so if I multiply all of this out, what do I get? I get minus the integral over I1, here's my cross terms, and minus the integral over I2, okay, is less than or equal to, and now I do the same thing with my t tilde. I can collect things a little bit. I'll collect the integrals over I1 and I'll collect the integrals over I2. Um, I'm also going to divide everything through by epsilon, which will become convenient in a moment. So if I collect things, what do I have? 1 over epsilon. Let's put the I1s on this side. Uh, so here I have, if I move it over, x t tilde minus t. And same thing, but now over I2. Uh, actually, I'm going to put this all on one side. Okay, and this is all less than or equal to zero. Okay, and now of course we're going to do the thing we always uh, expect to do when we have epsilons floating around. Uh, we're going to take a limit. And, and this is one of the parts where I say I'm assuming everything is nice enough. I don't want to go through all the technical details. Um, so what happens as epsilon goes to zero? As epsilon goes to zero, x here is approaching x1. Yes? Uh, t of x1, t of x1 is approaching y1, assuming t is nice enough and t tilde of x1 is approaching y2. Yes? And what's left over? What's left over is an integral of f over i1, which we said is equal to epsilon. Okay? So, so I'm really going to get something here that just depends on x1, x2, y1, y2, as I take the limit. Okay, so as epsilon goes to zero, okay, what do I get? I get that x1, y2 minus y1 plus x2, y1 minus y2 is less than or equal to zero. Okay, I've got right the same term here basically, modulo minus sign, so I can do a little bit of factoring here. Uh, and what am I going to get? If I move this to the other side of the equation, I'm going to get y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1 is greater than or equal to zero. So what does that mean about our map? It's 
moving everything in one direction. Yeah, in other words, it's monotone, right? So I, start, I said it doesn't matter whether I put y1 or y2 and what order they were in. But I did have an order for x1 and x2. I assumed x1 was less than x2. And now because these have a sign, this is positive, this better be positive too. So if x1 is less than x2, y1 is less than y2, the map is monotone. The optimal map has to be monotone. So there's lots of weird ways of rearranging mass, but in the case of the quadratic cost, the optimal map is monotone. That's what we found with the book moving problem, right? With the, with the linear cost, we could do lots of things. I could do this. With the quadratic cost, I said it had to be monotone. I slide things over. Okay, this is true in one dimension. Of course, we're not going to only study one dimension. We're going to study higher dimensions. There's a more there's some kind of monotonicity that you get in your optimal map in higher dimensions. It's not as simple as this. It's, it's a little bit more sophisticated. We we're going to talk about that. Um, but this is a little bit of intuition into what's going on with the quadratic cost. Um, why it's so nice to work with, why everybody likes working with, because somehow the maps, the maps are nice. They don't say, let's put this here and let's put that there and there. They just say, let's try to do this as kind of smoothly and cleanly as possible. That which, okay, that's not a rigorous or technical statement, but it gives you some intuition. Um, I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop there uh, with that note on one dimension. We'll say a little bit more about one dimension next time, uh, and then we're going to quickly get back to uh, some of the more, a little more intuition into the basic problems, and then moving back to the Kantorovich formulation and uh, what, what are some of the fundamentals we can learn about this problem.